James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. James Whitmore and Will Rogers have almost nothing in common. The one was born on a ranch in Indian Territory and received almost no schooling. The other was born in an upper middle class suburb of New York City and was graduated from Yale. And yet through his skillful characterization, James Whitmore has become closely, perhaps inextricably, identified with a late great American humorist. His one-man show, Will Rogers USA, has been touring the country for several years. But Will Rogers is but one of the many roles James Whitmore has successfully portrayed. After winning two awards in 1946 for his Broadway debut in Command Decision, he was signed to a contract by MGM, has played in a number of movies, in dramatic specials on television, and has been featured in the principal role in three television series. Mr. Whitmore, when you've played a character as long as you've played Will Rogers, do you begin to unconsciously take on some of the mannerisms? Do you begin to think at moments that you are Will Rogers? Well, I would. Uh, you'd have to check with my family on that, you know, mm -hmm. some objective observer, because I certainly am not aware that I have. I certainly have tried to get inside the man, and I've found some awfully nice things in there. Mm -hmm. How did you study for the role? Well, I read uh, all of the things that I could uh, get about him. I saw film clips on him. They had uh, Pathé News in those days. You were uh, fortunate that he lived in a time when there was indeed. film. Indeed. So fortunate and unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunate there are why? those, well, unfortunate in the sense that there are those that remember him. Mm -hmm. If I were doing an imitation of uh, Alexander Hamilton, there would be no one that could say <laughs> right. that isn't accurate. Mm -hmm. But. Um, Doing Rogers, there is that, it's unfortunate, but not, uh, not that bad. But the fortunate side of it, as you say, was that there was all of this material available, and it's the keeper of the flame, as it were, uh, was a marvelous woman named Paula Love, who uh, kept all of the archives in Claremore, mm -hmm. Oklahoma. They're still there. Paula passed away about a year ago. And uh, so that was all made available to me, plus the fact that this is not a one-man show in any sense of the term, quite aside from the fact that the show is Will Rogers, and mm -hmm. he's the man that's up front totally. Uh, there are many, many people behind the scenes that have contributed tremendous amounts to the show, and the researchers, a man named Brian Sterling's done a marvelous mm -hmm. job, most particularly a man named George Spota. Uh, I don't mean to sound as though I'm accepting an Emmy here or yeah. something and thanking <laughs> everybody, but I mean to give credit where credit certainly Have you is and, and your colleagues in this venture attempted to choose that part of Will Rogers that seems most relevant to the current scene? Yes, I think so. It's certainly been uh, an aim. And uh, it isn't too hard because uh, the problems that we have today, we had then. Mm -hmm. The cast of characters was different in those days, certainly. Uh, the problems themselves had different names attached to them. Mm -hmm. Teapot Dome was the name given to the oil problem in those days. In the and 20s. the scandal. As and well. the scandal, the mm -hmm. attendant scandal mm -hmm. and the investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now another name put on it, uh, the energy crisis, I guess is what they call it. But it still is involved with the giant uh, oil companies and the control that they have over mm -hmm. this very essential source of energy in our country. So uh, all of the things that Roger spoke about, not all, certainly, but I would say somewhere within the area of 60 to 70 percent of the things that he spoke about, we have them today, the mm -hmm. same problems. Have, did you feel any necessity to get entirely into the role of the character? You, 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 you inevitably would be compared with Hal Holbrook in his performance of Mark Twain, and his is a performance. He attempts to look, to act like Mark Twain. Yeah. You seem more to suggest Will Rogers than to play Will Rogers. 
Well, I certainly tried to find the essence of the man. I mm -hmm. think any actor does when you try to portray a character. Uh, I tried to find what it was, what the genius element was mm -hmm. in this man that permitted him to tell us truths in this country. What was that genius element? I think the basic, there are many mm -hmm. a aspects to it. These are things I've been able to mm -hmm. find imperfectly in my quest because I certainly wasn't uh, able to really find the nexus of the man. But I think the basic thing was that he had, as we used to say in the Marine Corps, seen the elephant and heard the owl. He knew man's depravity. He knew man's uh, maliciousness. He knew all of the bad and dark side of the mm -hmm. human nature because he had come up uh, among the Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma, and they were the most abused. And this is a very hard statement to make because they had, all tribes had been abused. I suspect that if we, one had to pick a tribe that was abused most, it would be the Cherokee nations. And uh, he removed grew, from the southeast, in, indeed, in, in, and taken in America, from their and ancestral homes, made mm -hmm. to walk, as you know, on the Trail of Tears, mm -hmm. out to Oklahoma. And so he knew the dark side, and of course he was brought up in the Oklahoma Territory in those days. It was I was surprised to discover he was not brought up in poverty. He was brought up in relative affluence. And for, for the, the, the time and the, and, the, yeah. and the area, certain, mm -hmm. certainly uh, affluence. And, uh, he could have had the education he didn't have. Really. He chose not to have mm -hmm. it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, he did. He was much better educated than he uh, uh, protested mm -hmm. that he was, which was a part of his stage image. Mm -hmm. But to get back to the other question, he, how, what was the nexus of his genius? It was, in my view, that he knew the, the dark side and he knew the light side, and he still was able to have a shout of joy for the fact of living and the, 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 the very, the very uh, thing of being alive was a marvelous mm -hmm. thing to him. And he found man infinitely amusing and entertaining in his uh, uh, peregrinations, his, uh, you know, the way yeah. that he was able to manipulate. And, and the Cherokees indeed themselves had been great manipulators. They had adopted the white man's ways. And they did it in the east, on the eastern seaboard in Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida, where they lived. Mm -hmm. His father was known as what? A white Cherokee, wasn't he? Yes, they were his, his grandfather was. Grandfather. Was a, a white Indian, white they Indian. were called, mm -hmm. yes, because they, his uh, mother, his grandfather's mother had intermarried with an Irishman and so on. Mm -hmm. And Will himself, his father was uh, one-eighth Cherokee, his mother was a quarter-blood Cherokee, and Will said he'd never gotten fur enough in arithmetic to figure out just how much Indian that made him. <laughs> but there was nothing in his life of which he was more proud than his mm. Indian blood. Mm. How did you happen to choose him? Well, I didn't. Uh, it was brought to me. And unlike Holbrook, Hal, of course, he made that thing happen, the, mm. the, the Mark Twain thing. I was approached about doing the character and uh, had great misgivings about doing it. Didn't think I could do it. Why were you approached, do you know? I have no idea. Hmm. I have no idea. Because there is obviously some resemblance. Is there? Inevitably. I didn't think it was that obvious. Mm -hmm. no, I never mm -hmm. noticed that mm -hmm. at all. And certainly didn't feel it myself mm -hmm. that it there was any It took you kinship. some time to get inside Will Rogers. It did then. indeed, and it happened. One of those, uh, I suppose we all have it happen, where you suddenly say, Eureka, I found it. Mm -hmm. And it happened to me when I turned to my wife at one point in New York when I was working on the material, and I said, listen to this. And I said a few lines from Rogers. And a smile broke across her face. Mm -hmm. And I guess at that moment, and I think, I really believe this to be the truth. We're never sure about our, you know, the things that one mm -hmm. recounts becomes legend in your own head. But I think that was the moment when I knew mm -hmm. that I had it. Not had it, but that I was going to be able to at least uh, reasonably mm -hmm. portray uh, this guy. I saw the show at least two months ago here in Los Angeles. And the night I saw it, the woman behind me exclaimed, he's enjoying himself, <laughs> speaking of you. That was a great tribute. Are you, are you in fact enjoying yourself? You do it night after night. Well, I for love many, to many act. Months. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I like my work. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Indeed, I enjoy it. Whether it's uh, a pure, unalloyed joy is another question mm -hmm. entirely. Because but it must uh, be an enormous strain to be on that stage for what two hours, something of that sort. It is indeed. And Alone. Could, but, but when it's working, mm -hmm. when it's it's working with an audience, and when an, because an audience feeds back not only laughter, uh, tears, uh, disapproval, mm -hmm. they also feed back energy. There's an energy quotient that makes the living theater a very special place mm -hmm. on this earth. That nothing, the electronic medium or uh, movies, uh, any mechanical medium cannot afford the entertainer nor the audience. And that is that wonderful interplay that happens between a performer and an audience. They do energize the performer. Then. Oh, my goodness. Unless, of course, they're totally disapproving. Yeah. You know, if, if you have feel you they're about that, to come and get you. You haven't had that happen with Will Rogers, have you? No, I have had pockets, certainly, of oh. disapproval. Oh, yes, indeed. 
But that's inevitable. I've done it I don't know how many times, but certainly hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of times. And it's inevitable that you're going to find somebody mm -hmm. that for one reason or another, maybe a personal problem, uh, doesn't approve at all of what you're doing. <laughs> and you sense that. That's mm -hmm. a very strong current. As I said, just as disapproval, or, or rather approval, is mm -hmm. a very strong current. I couldn't help but think, as you were on that stage for all that time, with Will Rogers' words, and they are only Will Rogers' words. That's right, yes. And I've, cause I've heard audiences argue that you keep throwing in things that refer to current events. But only they, prepositions but you, and But you do that announce nature. that they are. It's, it's, they uh, are, yes, indeed. I couldn't help but think that while you're on that stage for two hours, Will Rogers himself, when he spoke those words, often uh, usually did it in, what, five, six, seven-minute bursts. He never That's was right. a, a performer when who went on. When he worked in vaudeville in the, in mm -hmm. the Ziegfeld Follies, uh, he was pretty much maximum seven to eight minutes yeah. yeah when he worked however he went on lecture tours and he would speak sometimes depending on the audience if they were in a chatty mood he would go on for two and three hours oh. and he'd sit down very often on the uh, forefront of the stage and just chat with his mm -hmm. legs dangling over the stage just to talk with him I also couldn't help but think that here is this essentially city boy doing this country character because you are a city boy I suppose I am, although I came from country people. All of my progenitors, mm -hmm. yeah, were from farm people. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad certainly carried with him. He was the only child in his family of four brothers that went to the big city. So it w wasn't very far removed mm -hmm. uh, from the cow pasture. It was the big city buffalo in this case? He in was? this case, it was indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, not my, in my father's case, mm -hmm. he then went, uh, well, all over the place. and. Uh, he spoke for the International Committee of the YMCA for, for years, and uh, I was born in White Plains, New York, mm -hmm. so, but he went from city to city in various capacities. So you grew up partially in Buffalo, went to school there? Indeed. And entered theater there, didn't you? Mm, well, I... I was thinking of Gilbert and Sullivan, didn't you? Well, that was Gilbert? in high school, yes, and that uh, was done uh, because I loved it, but didn't admit I loved it, and I always told the guys to on the it? football team... Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh mm -hmm. yes, it was. It was vaguely effeminate mm -hmm. uh, in high school when I went to school, and maybe not so vaguely. And uh, <laughs> I, I told the football team that the music teacher insisted that I do these things. Mm -hmm. And of course, in my heart, I knew I, I, I loved doing them. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a little and found. I think got the taste of it. I think you're right. I got the you taste. You didn't have of to worry it. about being effeminate. You were an athlete and an athlete of considerable skills, as a matter of fact. Didn't you go on to school with athletic scholarships and football? Yes, I did. I went to uh, the Choate School uh, on an athletic scholarship, although the Choate School would deny it vehemently. They, <laughs> they would say, well, he had other attributes, yes. too. But essentially, they had uh, state championship teams mm -hmm. at the Choate School, and then I went on to Yale from there. Again, on a scholarship. Uh, on a football scholarship, mm -hmm. yes. And once again, Yale would vehemently deny that, even at the time. They no longer have them at all. Mm -hmm. But in those days, they did indeed have them. Did you go to Yale for drama? Were you interested in No, I went an actor? to Yale, I think, to play football. Hmm. And then I, both my knees were uh, injured. And uh, from th then I had to divert in some way. I lost all the money that was available for football players. And so then we, there were other sources of income, such as a nightly sports show, and we started a radio station at the university. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the directors of that, and uh, I had a sponsor for my nightly sports show. So performing came fairly early then, if not It drama. did indeed, yeah, mm -hmm. and the exigencies of, uh, of having money were, were the things <laughs> that, that really pushed me into Yes, it. you quit Yale before you graduated and joined the Marine Corps. You made reference to the Marine Corps early on. Went yeah. to the South Pacific. Uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was sent my diploma. I graduated from Yale. They oh, did accelerated you? in mm -hmm. 1942 after mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor, and I was able to take my comprehensive examinations. Mm -hmm. uh, we all were, uh, a little in advance of our senior year. Mm -hmm. And so when I was at Paris Island, they sent me my sheepskin. Because I thought you had returned to no, Yale no. after after the war. No, I was able to get it all in before World War II. Well, you did return to the South Pacific after the war. When you left yes, the Marine Corps, you went mm -hmm. then into entertaining and right back to the South Pacific again as an entertainer. Yeah, a very interesting, it seems to me, interesting mm -hmm. thing happened that uh, kids are doing now. I have eight uh, children, and so I'm not out of touch totally with the young people. And uh, they're all doing something now, kind of a sabbatical after high school. You perhaps have, have noticed mm -hmm. this, and it's an interesting phenomenon. I think it's very good. In my day, you didn't do that. Uh, very rarely did anybody pause That's after right. the high school experience before they decided to go on to college. Uh, you were thought strange, if not incompetent, if indeed, you stopped. Indeed, lazy or something, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, 
they're doing it now. I did it, but it was enforced. The, uh, the war came along, and for four and a half years, I was in the, in the Marine Corps, and under kind of traumatic conditions, as we all were in World War mm -hmm. II. And it gave me time to sort myself out a little bit and decide, really, where was I headed, and was I headed in the right direction, and so on. A time to think uh, that is rarely afforded young mm -hmm. people, it seems to me. And the pressures of family, the pressures of friends push very often like into maturing. areas that you find out too late, 15 years later, with a house in Greenwich or wherever it might be, with one and a half dogs and three and a half children, that this isn't what I meant at all, as mm -hmm. T.S. Eliot said. And I had that time. So during that time, the last thing on earth when I began the sorting process, and one of the things was to be a minister, and the other thing was to be a lawyer, which indeed at that moment seemed to be the ma major thrust mm -hmm. for me. And then way down here, there was this little item uh, Gilbert and Sullivan you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and a little, and a few dramatics I have done w with my hand tied behind me at Yale because I was going with a girl in the drama school. I told myself, and down there was that thing, and I went through all of these various arrays of tidbits that I've been lugging around inside me all these years, and this thing of performing, I decided was when I was most fulfilled and most happy, and I was the most surprised person in the world when I discovered that. And because of the time I had and the war and all, and it had changed a lot of my feelings about life, which once again had all been kind of monolithic, you know, my Methodicism, mm -hmm. my mother being a Methodist and my religious background and all. I said, well, by golly, why don't you try it? And uh, I was able to. What? Because the government gave us $20 a week for 52 weeks, you may recall, yes. the 5220 Club. And so I could afford to do it. Mm -hmm. And I tried it, and of course I loved it, and of course I was very, very lucky. You say those years changed your, your feelings about life. What became the top priorities then? Well, Satisfaction? Uh, doing what you wanted to do? No, really the, the, the priority was what do I replace uh, the things that I believed in before, very devoutly mm -hmm. and, and very assuredly were shaken, in many instances cracked, in many instances totally destroyed by my experiences in World War II. My problem, my next priority became, now that I no longer accept those as verities, mm -hmm. as, a, as a way of life, what do I replace them with? And I think it's, of course, a problem that afflicts the entire society now, that as we destroy values or say that they no longer have the value they once did, what do we replace them with? That was my biggest priority. What do I replace them with? Well, of course, what I replaced them with were elements of those things, mm -hmm. not the totality of the things that I had been brought up to believe, but elements of those things. And so that was how I began to rebuild some sort of a philosophy mm -hmm. of life and adjustment to human beings and people and, and living my life. How did you get into the theater? Well, I went to New York and looked for a job and got one the first day. With no training? No uh, real training at all, no. I went to the American Theater Wing to get some training, mm -hmm. which accepted servicemen after the war, and that didn't cost me anything. And then I got a job, as I say, the first day, and went back to the Pacific, where I'd been in the Marine Corps, on the same islands that I'd uh, been in the invasion. Did you of. expect to go back to the Pacific when you signed up for the No, US I didn't. Though? I just went to get a job, mm. and uh, to be paid money course. Mm -hmm. I think actors say this generally speaking, to be paid money for something that you adore doing is, is paradise. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, so that's how I got my first job. Then there was a long dry spell after that in New York when I was uh, not starving because I had the 20 bucks a week. And uh, the, I think the most interesting thing about that entire thing was the, the fact that going into theater, coming from Yale University in the the, uh, what most of the guys at school uh, wanted to do, which was advertising or banking or Wall Street mm -hmm. or business. And I'd say by most, 99 and 91 percent were going to do some of those things, maybe right. They were the, the, the weird ones, too. They were a little <laughs> yes. flaky. But to go into the theater was absolutely unheard of. And that was an inter and still is to this day, an interesting adjustment. And I have some dear friends who were friends of mine at Yale, very gifted, talented guys, one of them, who went into business and tried desperately two, three, four different businesses, finally said at age 45, it's all a big mistake. I really should be playing the piano in some saloon and, uh, and doing patter songs. And uh, he's a very gifted man. So. 
that was kind of an interesting aspect. You had a very good beginning in your first supporting role on Broadway. Indeed. Won two awards. Indeed. The Tony yes. and the Donaldson Awards. That was in command decision. That was an advantage to you, wasn't it? Not a handicap to have started off oh, I think in such so. a blaze of glory. Oh, I choose to think it was, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I don't think it's been downhill from there. I, uh, no, it was, it was good, of course, and bad, too. I don't know mm -hmm. what you mean by that, because when you start out and it becomes and seems too easy, there can be a great danger inherent in that. But mm -hmm. I went to the actor's studio, or was accepted into the actor's studio almost immediately. And what there to four had been simply something I did because I could do it easily and it was fun to do. I began to realize that there was an element of craft in acting. That acting could be more than just an uh, inspiration of the moment mm -hmm. uh, or simply make-believe. Although in, in its basic terms, that's what acting is, make-believe. But the use of the, of the instrument uh, as a violinist or a pianist the use of the human instrument, which is the actor's instrument, that you can use that as specifically and as precisely as a pianist uses his fingers and his fingering on the keyboard, or any artist uses things in a technical sense. Mm -hmm. So that was good in, in giving me a sense of the, really, I suppose, the importance of the craft, the craft. You were sometimes referred to as a young Spencer Tracy. That couldn't have been an advantage to have been identified with someone else so closely. I don't know about that. I, 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 I would suspect, as you suspect, that it wasn't an advantage. Did you but ever to, meet uh, Spencer Tracy? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I met him. And, uh, very, of course, it seems to me a great actor. Mm -hmm. But I've never dwelt on that aspect of it at all. It seemed to me a rather dead-end street and spinning my wheels. It would be a fruitless kind of an examination because if I decided that it was uh, destructive, I don't know what I can do about it. <laughs> Has your acting style been influenced by others, other actors? Oh, heavens, I think uh, mm. it has to be. Mm. Inevitably, I think our lives are influenced uh, certainly by others, the people that we brush up against and the people we admire and maybe even the people we don't admire. Uh, push us in the other direction. Mm -hmm. But it has indeed. Uh, good actors influence me uh, tremendously. I always become, once again, very proud of being an actor when I see an Olivier or a Richardson mm -hmm. uh, or a Tracy or uh, whatever, great, uh, Marlon Brando, when I see them work. I, I realize that it can be a very communicative uh, profession. You've played in a number of stage plays and a great many movies in television serials and in dramatic specials. And you've also done at least one other one-man show, Walt Whitman. Well, Walt Whitman uh, was not really a one-man show. I had people behind me reading poetry from oh. Whitman. Mm -hmm. uh, but in essence, I suppose it would qualify as a one-man show. What's brought you the greatest satisfaction as an actor? All of these, or have some been more satisfying than others in terms of fulfillment? I don't, uh, I, I think perhaps Rogers would qualify as the most fulfilling. However, there have been moments, I think the moment that's most fulfilling is when the audience and the performer are on the same wavelength. They understand each other as only brothers can understand. They know what the actor is about, what he's doing, still not withholding from him the ability to surprise them. Mm -hmm. They're not ahead of him, they're with him. Once they get ahead of you, you're in terrible trouble, usually. And those moments have happened in the theater, and when they happen, they are absolutely, uh, what, blessed mm. moments. In Rogers, you're playing to the audience. In drama, of course, you're playing for the audience. That yeah. same thing happens, even though you're not looking at the audience oh, and yes, addressing indeed, them. Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. There, there's a moment when you, the playwright, the director, all of the elements come together, and it makes a marvelous moment. And, and those are, uh, and of course, they're ephemeral. I mean, they go, and they're gone. Mm. That's, I suppose, one of the bad things about the theater. People say they saw Barrymore's Hamlet. You ask them, well, what was so great about Barrymore's Hamlet? You can't describe it. It's like, I suppose, your wedding night. You can mm -hmm. never adequately describe if it happened to be good mm -hmm. or a disaster. You can never capture that specific moment in time again. Uh, and on film, of course. Is that more there. exciting than knowing that on film it is there? Yes, I think so, time. because disaster is always just around the corner. You know, mm -hmm. life becomes, we all know, more vivid the closer you get to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the living theater implies that it can be dead, that you mm -hmm. can die mm -hmm. of an evening. 
And so that's what makes that marvelous, is that you know that disaster, literally, the set may fall down at any minute, the audience may lose, you may lose that thing that you had with them. They may become disapproving, even hostile the next minute. And that makes it tremendously exciting and great for the adrenaline, you know. Before you get forever cast in concrete as Will Rogers, <laughs> are there other things, you'd, <laughs> other things you'd like to do that you look forward to doing in theater? Oh, n uh, specific uh, things. I'd like to do Mencken. I'd, I'd love to do H.L. Mencken someday. A quite different kind of Indeed. character than Will Rogers. My dream, uh, and I have one, uh, is to do Mencken, Rogers, and Whitman in repertory and take it to the universities around the country and devote an entire week to those three gentlemen because it seems to me with Rogers, starting with Whitman on the one hand and going to Rogers and then winding up with Mencken, that you have a really a cross-section of American thought that is really quite remarkable and spans. What do they have in common? Well, they're all three of them very wise gentlemen, I mm. think. They were, they were quite smart. Uh, and I think that would be, they, they, they were wise. And they were perceptive and they were sophisticated. And of course, their means of, of imparting their sophistication and wisdom was totally different. And that's why I think they're a marvelous triumvirate. And I'd love to take it to the universities and then have a symposium uh, symposia afterwards for say two or three days just finding out where these men can illuminate our entire national experience. And for an actor of course there's the satisfaction of the language of all three. Indeed. Each express themselves in different ways. Oh indeed, indeed. But yes. so well. Yes. But that would be, I think, about the only dream I have, except to live to 110 or something of the sort. Why do you want to live to 110? Well, why not? I <laughs> at the moment, I, uh, I, I can think of a lot of reasons why not, but sure, I, uh, don't you want to, to live a long time? I, it it's certainly the only is game I'm sure of, you know. The others, I'm not sure of. It's true, but it would also seem to me to indicate that you enjoy the moment you enjoy life, you enjoy what you're doing. If you oh, didn't, indeed. you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to live to be 110. I'm sure. Indeed, indeed. Because I learn something. It seems to me new every day. Not all very attractive, mm -hmm. but uh, it, 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 I think that's the excitement of life. Is that every day I, I learn something just a little different. You know mm -hmm. that I didn't know the day before. On the stage as well as off the stage. I think of both. Oh mm -hmm. yes, yes, yeah. There's so much. One of my sons just announced that he was going to become a psychology major. And it's very exciting to me because I think that's where the frontiers lie. Not in outer space, but in inner space within us, I think. That, and oddly enough, he wants to do it with a, with a minor in forestry. Mm. And when people say, how can you find any compatibility between the two, he says, but don't you understand to get the forests and to preserve the environment, people must understand themselves and their needs. And, uh, the thing that is is, is them uh, intellectually. Thank you. Thank you.